UFC Vegas 87 just recently wrapped up, and I'm going to recap the entire card. I'll start with the first fight of the night and then work my way up to the main event. Make sure you guys smash that like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. And let's talk about the first fight on the card. It was Loik Rajabov versus Abdul Karim El Salwadi. First round, Rajabov was looking pretty solid and it was competitive, but I edged it towards him. Second round, it seemed like El Salwadi was really starting to take over. Look, Rajabov was looking awkward on the feet, getting touched a little bit, even got buckled a little bit. And I think that El Sawadi seemed to be the fresher guy. To start round three, the line was fully favoring Abdul El Sawadi, Abdul Karim El Sawadi, I should say, as you know, a big live favorite. I thought he was on his way to winning. Momentum was definitely on his side. Loik Rajabov catches him with a massive overhand right, flattens him. And the referee, I think, was shocked by the knockout because... El Salwadi is unconscious, just eating hammer fists. I don't know, it was like 12 of them after he was already finished off. They stopped the fight. It's over. Rajabov with an upset win and a fight that it seemed like was going away from him. One shot changes everything. Like right above the ear, lands it, knockout. El Salwadi goes down. Good comeback win. Or I guess it was 1-1, so maybe not a comeback. But didn't look great for Rajabov heading into round three. He beat the prospect. Good win for the vet. Next fight was Ludovic Klein versus A.J. Cunningham. It was a sacrificial lamb out there. A.J. Cunningham, we got to love the story. I mean, the dude's a savage. He was uh, abused growing up pretty harshly, and it's definitely, you know, credit to him being tough as nails. But Ludovic Klein was a substantially better fighter with way more technical prowess in the striking, was super precise, picking his shots extremely well, dropped Cunningham with the front kick to the solar plex, to the stomach, uh, and then down goes A.J. Cunningham. Ludovic Klein's stand-up was so on point. He was precise. He beat up Cunningham really bad. And he started going to the body, which I liked a lot, because Cunningham takes a great shot to the chin, but you get hit in the body and the wind's out of you, I don't care how tough that chin is, you're going down. It's a little bit different. Ludovic Klein, he took on a short-notice replacement in Cunningham, he was initially uh, supposed to take on the name that has now escaped me, but let's double check. It was supposed to be Joel Alvarez, which was actually a, a pretty high pedigreed fight because Alvarez is a decent guy around the top 25, I'd say, of the lightweight division. Cunningham's short notice replacement. I think we could get a booking against uh, Alvarez as a rebook. If the UFC is looking to match up, you know, prospect versus prospect, maybe even like somebody to the level of Daniel Zell Huber or Manuel Torres could be next. But I don't know if they want to sacrifice those Mexican prospects like that because Klein is really good and he's been in the UFC a while now and he seems to be coming into his own. So good performance for Klein. Christian Leroy Duncan, Claudio Hibero. Leroy Duncan dominated this whole fight. Hibero was extremely gun-shy and stiff. He had his high guard up, and he really just wasn't throwing anything. Christian Leroy Duncan touched him up with a lot of strikes from the outside. He was very creative, throwing kicks, punches, elbows, knees. I like Leroy Duncan's stand-up a lot, and I think this was the best performance of his UFC career. He really showed a new level, but where he got the fight done was on the ground. He showed us some grappling skills. He beat the shit out of Hibero from top and got a ground and pound stoppage. I mean, it was one-way traffic throughout the whole fight. Christian Leroy Duncan was substantially ahead throughout the entire damn thing. And Hibero was looking for one or two big punches that just never came. He didn't throw any jabs. It's just wide hooks, and that's about it. Leroy Duncan just was way better, and he put on a good performance. I'm excited for what's next, man. He's coming into his own at 28. Definitely going to have him in Manchester this summer or England. I think they're going to Manchester, though. Obviously, I know that's England, but the specific part, I think, is Manchester. Eamon Zahabi, Javid Basharat. This one was tough to watch. Basharat's stock fell tremendously here. Eamon Zahabi wins a back-and-forth competitive fight. Basharat, I think, got the first round. And then second and third, Zahabi just landed cleaner strikes. Basharat doesn't have power at all. That's something that I'm noticing as a fatal flaw. He's not heavy-handed. And then in this fight specifically, he couldn't land takedowns either. So he had to just sit and strike with Zahabi. And Zahabi's powerful. He throws decent right hands. He's got some looping punches he can mix in. His head movement isn't bad. And Basharat not being a guy which much, you know, thud on his shots. Zahabi was comfortable to swing. 
and he deserved a win at the end of it. Stopped a lot of takedowns. Basharat just got beaten by a veteran, man. 14-1 and one now. Definitely stalted the hype train. Rough to see, I guess, because I really thought Basharat should beat Eamon Zahavi. I mean, Zahavi's a guy that was out for a little while after some losses. Does have a sick knockout of Irichi Long. Fight before this one. And his power looked legit even here. He made Javid Basharat very cautious because Basharat would feel his power and he didn't want to explode with strikes and let out crazy combinations. Zahabi outworked him. Competitive striking match. He landed the better shots. He deserved the win at the end of it. 29-28. Good upset for Eamon Zahabi. He was plus 575. That's crazy, right? Plus 575. Savage. Next fight was... A banger. I mean, I think this is definitely fight of the night. Vinicius Oliveira, Bernardo Sopa. Round one, Sopa and Oliveira, competitive moments, but we're seeing that Sopa is pretty good. That's what I was thinking after round one. Okay, Sopa, this kid's this kid's solid. He's got skills. He's technical. Guard shots well. Ate some heavy shots. Ate some heavy low kicks, but was tight and throwing good shots. Round two, he beat the shit out of Oliveira. I mean, it looked like he was going to win. Then at the end of round two, Oliveira ends up on top and did substantial damage, and Sopa was gassed. There was a time in round two where Sopa had the back. He had ground and pound positions. Like It looked like the fight was moments away from getting stopped by the referee. Instead, Oliveira was able to scramble, get on top, was fully recovered, had way more gas, and then round three comes around. Sopa looked dead. He got touched up on the feet, kicked hard, and to finish off the fight, he gets sent back with a big shot and then kind of like fades away but isn't looking at Oliveira. It happened one other time in the fight where he wasn't looking at Oliveira. Oliveira comes with the flying knee from hell and finishes Sopa by brutal third-round knockout. Holy shit, knockout of the year contender for sure. Performance of the night, fight of the night. I was saying when Sopa was on point, like he was reminding me of Ilya Teporia. I think he has tremendous potential. But Oliveira has zero quit in him. He was in bad spots in this fight. Sopa was beating him up. Takedowns were on point for Sopa. But Oliveira doesn't break. He's athletic. He's strong. He's very powerful. And uh, he got one of the most vicious knockouts I've ever seen. Sopa was down and out brutally. And then he's like limping out of the cage. The leg kicks were really fucking up Sopa. I think actually it was the leg kick that sent Sopa kind of off balance and like running away from Oliveira right before that flying knee landed. Beautiful performance. Oliveira's a fun guy to watch with the sick style. You, this, this is not the last you've seen of Sopa. He's 23 and I think he has great skills. Unfortunately, one little mistake at the highest level of this game, you end up getting flatlined brutally in a fight that looked like was going his way. It looked like he was close to a stoppage. And then round ends, he's done. I mean, he got reversed too and stuff. Like Oliveira finished the second round strong and stole it. Yeah, great performance for Oliveira. Six style, 50K, fight of the night too. Give him 100,000. Next fight was the featured prelim. Eric Anders, Jamie Pickett. Jamie Pickett, before the fight, they announced that he was retiring. He said he wants to race or ride the bull of uh, Dana White. Eric Anders gets caught and dropped in the first round. And then, for the most part, he just smothered Jamie Pickett against the cage, landed some takedowns, controlled from top, did a bit of damage with ground and pound, but nothing substantial. And Eric Anders got a decision win. Jamie Pickett's retiring. Five losses in a row for Pickett, and he's retiring. It kind of worked out pretty well. And uh, Eric Anders with a subpar performance, I would say, because getting dropped was a bad look. But he did what Eric Anders can do. He uses his athleticism, and he can outmuscle a lot of guys that uh, lack the skill of, like, the upper echelon. And that's what he did exactly. He's a physical force. Backed up Pickett, picked him up, took him down a few times, did some ground and pound from top. Eric Anders got a deserving win. Jamie Pickett. Good luck in retirement. I hope he's financially secured and stable. And you know what? I hope he gets to ride that bull because uh, he's taking some, some tough L's in the UFC. But this is the most positive fight in a while for him. I mean, he rocked Eric Anders badly. He hurt him, and then he dropped him in the first round. So, Jamie Pickett, at least he's leaving the UFC, having you know touched up his opponent a little bit. But, yeah, that was the fight. Next fight brings us to our main card. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the likes. And if you're new, subscribe. Steve Ursaig. Matt Schnell, fun first round that was back and forth. Still, Urseg was edging it, but Schnell touched up Urseg a bit. Urseg kind of got a little wild 
in round one and even got stung by Schnell, which I like seeing it because Ursig's got a chin on him. Round two comes, the striking, and then perfect left hook and flat out goes Matt Schnell. It was a vicious knockout. Another $50,000 bonus is going right here. Steve Ursig deserves 50 k and he is a legit contender at 125 pounds. His hands are scary good. He's dangerous as fuck, and he's got the least menacing look of all the flyweights, but one of the most menacing punches in the flyweight division. Very precise, accurate, technically skilled, and I just think overall it was a creme de la creme, 10 out of 10 performance. He really fucked up Matt Schnell, and I thought it was awesome. Great performance for Steve Ursag, man. Flatlined him with the hook. It was beautiful. Beautiful shot. Out goes Matt Schnell. Flat out, too, like straight back. Yeah, Ursig deserves a big fight. I think he's definitely somebody to build for Australia. They got themselves a good flyweight on the come up right now. Great performance by Ursig. Next fight on the card, Umar Nurmagomedov versus Bekzat Almakan. Now, before everybody jumps ship from Umar Nurmagomedov, listen to my take here. Yes, Umar was stung early in the fight by Bekzat, dropped, but then he recovered using his wrestling and doing what he does best, and he dominated on the ground for three rounds. I think Bexad is actually a really solid fighter. He got up from the ground a couple times. But Umar is an insane pressure wrestler with crazy cardio and grappling pace. That's the Dagestan style. Umar Nurmagomedov's good. And I know people right now are going to see this and say, oh, he got fraud checked. And I hope that the bookies see the same thing. They won't, though. And I hope that he's a more bettable line in his next fight. Maybe he fights a Rob Font. He called out Corey Sanhagen after... But at this point, okay, getting hit by Bexot clean, it's just, to me, Umar versus Corey Sanhagen, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Corey Sanhagen beat Marlon Vera, who's fighting for the belt now. It's like, are we going to punish Corey Sanhagen with a really difficult stylistic matchup? I'd rather see Umar fight somebody else. I'd rather see Umar even Rob Font or Umar versus Jonathan Martinez, somebody like that. I think Umar is close to getting a number one contender fight, uh, but he needs he needs a legit win against like a real ranked fighter before you give him Corey Sanhagen. That's my honest take. I don't think you rush him to Corey. I think he needs somebody else first. Bexat, gutsy performance. He's 26. He's got a bright future in the game, and I'm interested in how he's going to look in fights moving forward from here. I really am. But yeah, Umar Nurmagomedov, dominating grappling display, trust me. He's putting a fuckload of bantamweights on their back. I want to see Marab and Umar at some point, but let, let Umar marinate a little bit. I think he needs one or two more before that type of fight. Next one was our featured bout, and it was supposed to be the flyweight number one contender fight, Mohamed Mokeev versus Alex Perez, specifically for Mokeev. And Mokeev won, but he was underwhelming with victory. I mean, Alex Perez had a good second round. Even in the third round, Mokayev is like dropping to a defensive position as he's shooting these takedowns. And I thought it was a horrible visual of him getting stuck in that front headlock position. And Alex Perez threw some elbows too as Mokayev was shooting against the cage. I definitely thought Mokayev got it 29-28 at the end of it. But it wasn't that performance that's like, yeah, that's the title contender. That's who's next. He did reveal in the post-fight interview that he was sick earlier in the day. I'll give some... I'll give some accuracy to that. I don't think Mokayev would lie about it. Maybe it could explain the subpar performance and him looking to slow down a bit. But Alex Perez is pretty tough. He's still got good leg kicks. He's got decent pop in his punches. I want to see more from Alex Perez. I don't think he should retire just yet. I hope that he ends up fighting in the UFC again. Because I'd be interested in seeing him fight some of these back-end guys at 125, you know, ranked top 15. For Mokayev, we're in a weird spot because... It's either we do Royval versus Pantoja 3, or you give Mokayev a chance at history fighting at UFC 301 for the flyweight belt, but after a very underwhelming performance. One of those fuck situations, huh? Yeah. I don't know where the UFC's head's going to be at. I'm not even sure where my head's at as far as what's next for Mokayev. Right after, I would say no title shot because it didn't sell me on him getting it. What's the biggest win to date? Alex Perez decision and Tim Elliott submission. The Elliott submission is more impressive, maybe, as far as how it looked. But Perez was the you know bigger name opponent. I get it. He was sick in the first round. He looked real good. So I guess if we go off the first round, he was looking like you know a future title challenger. And I definitely believe he's gonna be. 
We shall see what the UFC does. Nonetheless, Mokaev's game solid. His stand-up looked good in that first round, too. That's something I took away. Perez should stick around, though. He shouldn't call it. I'd want to see more out of Perez. Mokaev, maybe a title shot. We shall see. Co-main event was Vitor Petrino versus Tyson Pedro. The expectation for this fight was really high, so it just felt like a dud when it ended because Petrino didn't really land any stiff, stiff shots. I mean, he landed some decent jabs for sure. And on the ground, he slammed Pedro a couple times in the third round. Petrino deserved the win at the end of it. He put a pace on Pedro. He had him backed up. He outmuscled him for the most part, hit him with better shots. But he didn't get that flatline KO that I think he was definitely hoping for. But he's also 26. 26 at light heavyweight is super young. He's a baby in the light heavyweight division. I mean, shit, three champs ago, he was 42 years old, right? We've had some guys in the very late stages of their career become world champions at light heavyweight. Vitor Petrino is in the infancy of his career. He's, he's young. I think that his raw talent definitely carries him through in a lot of matchups. Now, after the fight, he called out Anthony Smith. Because Anthony Smith is looking to be extremely past his prime, I think Vitor Petrino would be live to win that fight. And also, he could outmuscle Smith. But I must say, beating Tyson Pedro by a decision, for me, does not grant you a ranked opponent next. Especially a Tyson Pedro who retired immediately after the fight and essentially said that this is not his dream anymore. And he was blessed to do it, but he was glad to call it. Tyson Pedro, you know what Pedro's biggest issue was too? He got to the UFC way too young. And for whatever reason, man, the injury too that held him out for a while. But he couldn't mold himself to be... I guess the level that maybe we thought he could have. Still, that's some sick knockouts. The Australia win last time out was dope. So good career on him as far as entertainment value. Always liked watching Pedro fight, but you can kind of see it in his eyes. He didn't have it anymore. He didn't want to be there anymore. Petrino, it's his time. Still a developing guy, though, and only 26. I guess what's the rush to the rankings? We'll see what the UFC decides to do. Petrino, nonetheless, though, athletic specimen. And if he can get those skills on point with the potential that I'm seeing... The ceiling being very high, I think he could be a problem and a legit top five, top ten light heavyweight. He's a Brazilian savage like the Costas of the world, like the Vitor Belforts. Now we got Vitor Petrino. Let's see. Main event of the evening. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the likes. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. It was an absolute shite main event as far as, you know, what went down as opposed to what was expected to happen. Now, I'm not trying to take away from Rosenstreich, who fought a perfect fight. For the most part, stopped takedowns, outboxed outbox Shamil Ghazi, outboxed him. Touched him up with jabs all night long and looked calculated and technical, for sure. Was not a super entertaining main event, but Jorginho Rosenstreich was able to keep that stick on Shamil and box him up. He touched him with good punches. Gaziev looked horrible shooting for awkward takedowns. Landed one nice single leg in the first round, but that was it for the whole fight. He missed on every other takedown that he shot. And he shot plenty of them. And then he got stuck in the boxing range and just got torn apart by Jarzinho Rosenstreich. Gaziev just doesn't seem to be a very fast twitch guy at all. Seems to have a lack of maybe distance management and closing the gap. He was not comfortable boxing with Rosenstrike. But I think the fact that Rosenstrike's takedown defense was strong, it killed the confidence of Gaziev. And he got chopped apart, touched up, beaten up from the outside for most of the fight. And, you know, he came in with a reach advantage, but it looked like Rosenstrike had way longer arms because he was pepping up Gaziev from the outside. Now, with Gaziev, though, let's say something. He quit in the corner after the fourth round. Now, he initially said, no, I can't see, I can't see. He's pretty much telling his coaches, I want out. Mark Goddard noticed something, and he forced the coaches to tell him what Gaziev said, and Gaziev said he can't see out of his eye. They stopped the fight in the fourth round. Gaziev wanted out. He got completely exposed as a heavyweight prospect. He became a heavyweight fraud. The UFC really had high hopes. I think they were all in on Gaziev, like, okay, we can build this Dagestan heavyweight. So they gave him a massive spot against the guy in Jarzinho Rosenstreich, who probably was viewed as flawed by the matchmakers. Substantially better grapplers exist, and Rosenstreich has lost to them. And it seemed to be that Gaziev would have significantly better grappling skills. What was unexpected is how bad the offensive wrestling was for Gaziev, how good the grappling defense was for Rosenstreich, and that jab just being so on point. 
for Jarzinho Rosenstreich. He moved really well in this fight, and Gazia really had a hard time cutting the cage off or doing anything. Then had a couple of shots, but not with much power on him. And Gazia doesn't throw kicks for the most part. He's pretty much boxing and takedowns. He got completely exposed, man. The Contender Series prospect goes to shit quick. And losing in the way that he did, quitting in the corner, hard sell moving forward. Don't expect him in another main event. Expect him on a prelim of a fight night card. I don't know who even against. I don't know if he'd even fight again. I mean, I hope that he does. He's only 34 for heavyweight. He's still got time. But any hopes of him being like high, high caliber? No, we need to close those hopes down. Jarzinho Rosenstreich showed that the gate is still closed for a guy to Gaziev's level. For Rosenstreich, it's interesting. Uh, the UFC post-fight show was like in my ear as I was getting ready to do this. And they were talking about potential matchups. Derek Lewis, Sergey Spivak, Tai Tuivasa. I love the idea of giving Rosenstreich a striker, whether it be Derek Lewis or Taito Ivasa. Either one of those matchups are a lot more intriguing to me than him fighting uh, somebody like a Spivak, potentially even somebody you know behind him that's just going to be wrestle-heavy. I want to see Rosenstreich flow with the hands. And, I mean, he stopped Gaziev's takedowns. I'm not saying he couldn't stop Spivak's either, but I do think Spivak is a little more effective in landing those takedowns than a Gaziev. For Gaziev, probably somebody unranked. I really don't know exactly what they're going to do. All these prospects have been fighting big fights against veterans and getting exposed, man. Main event with Joe Pfeiffer. We saw it happen. Saw it here with Gaziev. Saw it earlier tonight with Basharat, too. UFC veterans don't fuck around. And if you're not ready to turn that corner just yet, shit, maybe you don't fight him. The UFC shouldn't rush him into it. That's why with Petrino specifically, I'm not crazy about them putting him in a spot to fight an Anthony Smith. I know Anthony Smith is well past his best days, but I'd be lying to you if I didn't think that he's dangerous on the ground with submission attempts, decent little front kicks up the center. I'd still pick Petrino, though, just so you guys know. I'd still pick Petrino. It's just, uh, you know, why the rush at 26? Gaziev, fuck it, bro. Glaziev, we're not glazing him anymore. His uh, potential seems to kind of be towards the mid-tier. I think there's a chance he'd break into the top 15, but this Rosenstrike roll, this Rosenstrike loss this early in your career, getting beaten up like that and then quitting in the corner, it's going to be a hard pill to swallow. Wish him luck on the comeback for Rosenstrike, though. I'm excited for what's next. He's showing that he's evolving. He's got a good MMA mind. He's training with King Mo. The wrestling defense has definitely gotten better. And uh, I want to see him fight Derek Lewis at some point, please. So hopefully the UFC can set that up. I was down for that fight, no matter what the result was here for the main event. Now, as far as the picks, my record at close was eight wins and three losses. I started the night off with a big win with Loik Rajabov over El Salwadi. And then I won with Klein over Cunningham. Won with Leroy Duncan over Hibero. Lost with Basharat and Zahabi completely exposing him. Lost with Sopaj because I pick flipped following the updated prediction live stream to Sopaj after the weigh-ins. And then Oliveira ends up beating him. I should have stuck with the pick. I jinxed him, to be honest with you. And how good it was looking. I was like, this was a great pick flip finally. No, the pick flips, for the most part, always give me L's. So stick with the study. Don't pick flip it. Had Eric Anders over Pickett, even though he wasn't impressive. Had Steve Verseg over Snell. Umar over Bexat. Mohamed Mokayev over Perez. Petrino over Pedro. And uh, yeah, I lost with Gaziev to Rosenstrike. I had faith. I called him Lock of the Week Gaziev. And honestly, I fumbled the bag on that because I went against my own rule. Heavyweights, Locks of the Week, normally don't go hand in hand. I screwed myself trying to chase a better line. You know what? I should have just locked Leroy Duncan and just ate the flack for the absolute chalk. But it is what it is because we come back for 299 with absolute fire. I do think that we have to be honest here. Basharat getting exposed like that, rough, rough for the night. I think people are going to panic on Umar, but don't just yet. Mokayev, I don't think title worthy. And uh, Steve Ursaig, though, I think he might be the real prize of the night. Steve Ursaig had an absolute breakout performance and looks to be a future contender at 125 pounds, and I can't wait to see it. But my pick for performance of the night, I'm sending him to Steve Ursaig, and I'm sending him to Vincius Oliveira, and I'll also give Sopaj 50K. So we'll give Oliveira 100K. They got fight of the night for me. And then, yeah, Ursaig over Schnell is uh, probably a good, good little performance bonus. That's the direction I'm going in. I'll be honest, Leroy Duncan deserves a little sprinkle too. Same with even Ludovic or Loic, but, you know, we can't give performance bonuses to everybody. Those are my calls for AJ's performance bonuses of the night. I hope you guys enjoyed the week's worth of content. I'm looking forward to this coming week's worth of content. 
Full card predictions for two ninety nine dollars dropping tomorrow. And I'll also have a live stream every single day. So keep your eyes locked in the channel. Big things coming. Closing in on 29,000 subs. So make sure you sub it up if you haven't. Make sure you smash the like button too. I appreciate you all for watching and supporting me. Let me know what you thought of the fights in the comments. Eight and three records, not bad. But that guy, Ziavel, that ticked me the fuck off. It's just the way he went out, it was horrible. Horrible, 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 horrible. Much love, people. Thank you guys for watching. Big W's in the chat if you're enjoying the content. And I'll see you all in the next one. Peace out.